so there's two levels of love, right? There's the level of love that is like flaming coals. And then is the level of love that is called love in the light, uh, which the latter is a higher level. Love in the light is where I am completely one with God. That's all my desire, just to be one with God, just to be able to bask in his light and to uh, feel as if nothing else matters. Now, uh, we did emphasize last time, I recall, that being on that level doesn't mean that I'm escaping from this world, that I'm divorcing myself from this world. But I'm so one with God. And since God is the creator of this world, I can see his divinity in this world too. And that's what I'm connecting to. I engage in the world. But my engagement in the world is a divine engagement so that even a mundane activity like eating or even a mundane thing like this chair is used for holiness, is used to, to really reconnect it to the divine that is within it and that uh, from which it comes from. That's the oneness that I aspire to achieve, not a oneness that, again, makes me live on a on an isolated mountain and uh, divorces me from this world altogether. So that's, that was a, a, an important point that we made. And um, I think we're ready to continue. Let's, let's go to the bottom of page 240. Like you said, Margaret, does anyone want to read? Please. Thus it is written. I'll anyone? start. <laughs> okay. Thus okay. it is written in Eitz Chaim, Portal 50, Chapter 3, in name of the Zohar, that the evil is converted into and becomes completely good, like the good nature itself. Through the shedding of its soiled garments, the pleasures of this world in which it had been clothed. Mm -hmm. The Zohar distinguishes between desire itself and the garments of the desire, the negative forms it assumes. Because it is possible to separate the two, to strip the essential desire of the animal soul of its soiled garments, the desire can therefore be transformed and redirected from one extreme to the other. Right. Um, so, so just to explain that, I think it's a very powerful line, especially in education. Uh, the ultimate educator is someone who can see the, like Robert Steins once told me, the question behind the question or the desire behind the desire. Um, I remember that when I was about, what, 14 or 15, we were asked to write an essay. Uh, and the title of the essay, you know, in English, in the, the English class, the title of the essay was, I Want Three Dots. And the whole essay was to write about what I want in life. So some people wrote that I want to be a doctor. Some people want, uh, wrote that I want a, you know, a comfortable life. I want a good car and a good house and a good whatever. Um and I remember being consulted by my father and, and others that um, the, the end goal that we think we really are, want is really not the end goal. So, for example, people say, I want to be a doctor. What they are really saying is that they want to better the world. or They want to heal the world. But being a doctor is not necessarily the channel to heal the world. Sometimes it is. But sometimes you can be a therapist and heal the world just as much. Sometimes you can become a social worker and heal the world even more. So that end goal is sometimes not always reflective of the true desire. And I think that is what causes issues in life altogether. That people become things that they really did not want to become. They choose channels that are not a good expression of their true desire within. And this is what Rabbi Stanley is speaking about here, and the Tanya is speaking about, that there is what's called a desire, the desire itself, the desire within, and there's the clothing of the desire, the way we dress that desire, the way we give it expression. Unfortunately, very often, the clothing of the desire does not really reflect the actual desire. Like I said, if I want to heal, maybe I should think before becoming a doctor, to become a social worker or vice versa or, or other things. Let me see how I can best express the desire for healing. Because in order to truly express it, to express its very core, I need to find the best clothing, the best channel for it. And if I don't find the best channel, my desire will feel a little bit uh, uh, limited or even crippled. So that's, that, that's what this is saying. 
Now, it's true in work, of course, right? We use professional examples, but I think it's true in education too. Sometimes we, we like, little babies shout for, for ice cream, for candy. Is that really what they want? Maybe all they want is attention. Good educators know, know to tell. Oh, he's just shouting. Or, or a little baby acts as if he has a boo-boo. Does he really, does he really shout? Is he really, really shouting about his boo-boo? I mean, you can tell very easily that it's a tiny little scratch there. It's not hurting him. So what does the baby really want? He wants attention. He wants love. And sometimes, you know, the, the shout for boo-boo, for my boo-boo hurts when you grow up changes into sometimes ice cream. I want an ice cream. Do you really want an ice cream? You want love. You want, you want something sweet to, to elevate you. So you want something deeper. And, and sometimes that changes. You grow up and it changes into, you know, all sorts of other noises. Uh, very often the, 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 the noise that people make is really a, a, a clothing. It hides what the true desire is. And a good educator, again, is able to see the desire behind the clothing, or as we mentioned, the question behind the question. That's really the ultimate, the ultimate goal. You know, the the famous uh, there's a famous book. I don't know how famous it is, but uh, Elie Wiesel tells a cute story about in his book called The Memoirs. It's a two volume book. The first volume is called All Rivers Run to the Sea, and uh, Second volume is called "And the Seas Never Fall," and it's based on on a verse in Kohelet in Glaziastes. But there he tells the story of his life as a Holocaust survivor, as he became a, a journalist and author. But anyway, one of the stories he tells is that um, he was a journalist uh, living in Paris when the Six Day War broke out, or he was maybe I think visiting Paris, maybe even living in Paris, and. Um, he decided immediately to take the first plane to Israel. As a journalist, he wanted to cover the Six-Day War, 1967. And he's seated right next to his competitor, a journalist for another newspaper. Mm. Now, they both know why they're going. But of course, as good journalists, you can't give scoops, especially to your competitors. So uh, Elie Wiesel tells his competitor, the journalist that's sitting next to him, it's in the book, he says to him, oh, what brings you to Israel? And the uh, journalist says, I'm actually going to visit my uncle who's sick. <laughs> <laughs> so now the competitor asks Eli Wiesel, and what brings you to Israel? <laughs> he says, well, I'm going to visit my doctor, who is the one taking care of your uncle. <laughs> 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 but you know sometimes so so people speak that type of language but it's all clothing they speak it jokingly like that or they speak it they speak it really just psychologically and the best parents the best educators not identify the desire within it now that's from an education standpoint but from the desire standpoint we as human beings have to ensure that the desires of our souls are, very, are, are channeled in the best of ways, are clothed in the best of ways. Otherwise, again, the clothing, just like clothing itself, if I wear a 15 and a half shirt, which is what I wear, not that it's important at all, but then I go and buy myself a 13 size, I feel I feel like all, all uh, I don't know, all limited, all strangled. That's, that's what happens. That's the essence of education, I believe, the essence of the human experience. We have desires, the soul has desires, and very often we either ignore those desires or we give them a 13 shirt instead of 15, 15 and a half shirt, to mm -hmm. use that example. And then no wonder we start feeling all sorts of uh, negative sentiments inside. That's, that's really what this is talking about, this, the, 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 the garments, the, desire, the clothing for the desire itself. I, I'd love to hear your comments. I, I don't want to be monologuing. Hmm. I think it's true, not just in education. Let me add, I think it's true as friends. I'm sure we have friends who confide in us. Very often, I mean, you know, as a rabbi, it happens quite often. People confide and they say one thing, but then you dig deeper and you dig deeper and it's really something completely different. So they were maybe embarrassed to say the, the thing itself, the desire itself. So they dressed it with one 
hoping that that uh, you know they can avoid it. But at the end of the day, the ultimate desire is really what we need to relate to, both in ourselves and in people, and certainly in people that we educate. We'll say this, it's interesting because the word for garment in Hebrew, right, which is used now in this context, the garment for our desire, um, is beged. Now, beged in Hebrew is an interesting word because beged also comes from the word boged, it's the exact same word, in fact, which means betrayal. And um, that is because garments can betray what we truly are from the inside, right? Um, it gives a, a different message. It doesn't, they don't always reflect our innermost. And um, by the way, it's true in the Torah. Very often when garments are used in the Torah, they're used to betray, to give a different message. So for example, we read this, we read about this not too long ago when uh, Joseph's brothers attempt to kill him and they throw him in a pit and then eventually they sell him as a slave. They plot to go back to their father and tell their father that which means uh, a wild animal ate him. What do they do? They take Joseph's garment, his kutonet, his coat of, of many colors, and they spill, spill the blood of a, goat, of a goat on it. Why the blood of a goat? Because apparently the blood of a goat is very, very similar in color than the blood of a human being. So they were quite clever about it. And then they go and tell Jacob, look, this is our proof. We found his uh, coat full of blood. Uh, a wild animal must have eaten him. He's dead. Jacob refused to believe them. But what did they do? They used a garment to, to lie to him, to, to betray him. Uh, and garments, look, going back to Jacob. Jacob, what does he do to take his brother's blessing, Esau's? He dresses in the clothes of his brother. Very often garments in the Torah are used as a message of betrayal because beged means betrayal. And unfortunately, it's not just physical garments. It's also emotional garments, spiritual garments are very often used not to reflect our deeper self. And then we feel trapped. And we realize that sometimes a little too late. Like I said, some people become doctors when they really want to be accountants. Some people become accountants when they really want to be lawyers and so on and so forth. And it's true professionally, and it's true emotionally, and it's true psychologically, and it's true intellectually, and it's true in all levels. But that's that's the idea here. Okay, I'd love to hear your comments, otherwise we can continue. You know, just to conclude with this story, to conclude this thought with this story, and then we can continue. But uh, one of the great stories in the Hasidic world is how a Hasidic Jew was uh, was a very successful businessman would uh, travel some 200 years ago through the village of his rabbi, his Hasidic rabbi, for business. And every year when he would travel through that business to for that trade, he would stop by to visit his rabbi in that particular village. And when he would stop by to visit his rabbi, he would say to himself, I'm not going to, out of respect for my rabbi, I'm not going to go with my business clothes. I'm going to put on my Hasidic garbs. And uh, that's the way I'll go and meet my rabbi. And that's what he did every year. One year, he said to himself, who am I lying to you? What's, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to switch into Hasidic garbs for my rabbi. I feel like I'm dishonest. So he said, I'm going to stay this year with my business garments. And he stayed that year with his business garments. And he walked into his rabbi's office to get his rabbi's blessing and to speak to his rabbi. And the rabbi is shocked. He says, well, I don't recognize you with these clothing. Hmm. And he says, look, rabbi, I got to tell you the truth. Those are the clothing I wear all the time. Just every year when I come to visit you, I felt bad. So I switched to like Hasidic garbs, but really it was a lie. I was lying to you. So I felt dishonest. So I decided to stay in my clothes, in my regular clothes, but my regular business clothes. So the rabbi responded to him so powerfully. He said, you think I didn't know? I knew that. But I thought that when you were coming to me, you were coming with your real clothes. And when you were, you were wearing your business clothes, you were lying to the world. And that's fine. But when you come to me, you were authentic. Now you're telling me that this is your authentic self. But the idea again is what type of clothing are we wearing? What type of clothing wearing 
constantly? Are we wearing our authentic clothing, our real clothing? How do we define ourselves? And how do, I, how, do I clothe, how do our garments define us? If the answer to both questions is the same, then we're in a good spot. But if the garments define us in one way and our real selves is defined in another way, then we have this serious dichotomy that we have to deal with. And that's, that's really what this is about. Okay. Uh, again, I'd love to hear your voices. Otherwise, we can continue at the bottom, at the top of page 241. As an accountant. Yes, William. As an accountant, speaking for myself, I don't think anybody ever really wanted to become an accountant. <laughs> but they say, but they say an engineer dreams of becoming a mathematician. And a mathematician dreams of becoming a physicist. And a physicist dreams of becoming a philosopher. <laughs> and a philosopher dreams of becoming a theologian. <laughs> Very good. That's a good lie. That's a great lie. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Very good. Excellent. Excellent. That's right. So we have to make sure that there's no dichotomy there. All right. Okay. Let's continue. This means that one has to change, not the essence. Anyone, please. This means, yeah. Anybody else wanted to do it? No? Okay. This means that one has to change, not the essence of one's animal nature <clears throat> and the inner forces operating in the animal soul, but only their object. This, to some extent, explains the ambitious aims put forward by the author <clears throat> and their feasibility. Seen in this light, the idea of transforming the animal soul's material lusts into a love for God becomes more conceivable. Right. I just want to pause there because uh, th th so this whole idea of garments to our uh, inner desire is important for our dealings with the animal soul. Because very often the animal soul has a desire that does not need to be crushed, but rather needs to be channeled. Uh, it's like in the words of the Talmud. That some people are born with certain inclinations that could become very dangerous tools for the animal soul. For example, some people are born with a desire, I think we spoke about this in the past, but with a desire to kill, God forbid, to murder. So that's a desire of the animal soul and it could be very, very dangerous. So what should one do? One should garment, one should clothe that desire with something that will channel it in the right way, huh? so one should become a shochet, a slaughterer of animals, or kosher meat. Or one should become a moel, one who does circumcisions. Like this, you have really taken the desire and you've given it its fitting clothes so that it is channeled in the right way. It's true. The, the Talmud says that pe people have a desire for, uh, by the way, uh, you know, for murderers, the, the, I think the example in the Talmud is becoming a surgeon. If you become a surgeon, you deal with blood still, but you've, you've used it in the most effective way, right? Mm -hmm. But um, it's true, I think, for I think the other example that's brought is sex addicts. Sex addicts, unfortunately, I mean, it's a terrible addiction, but sometimes all they want to do is love or give or think like they're loving. So channel that towards being kind, towards acts of kindness. And, and those are extreme examples, obviously, addictions and murder, et cetera. But I think it's true also for smaller, smaller examples, smaller traits that we may have. You know, in, in Judaism, as opposed to, to Christianity, we don't have cardinal sins, right? In, in Christianity, you have seven cardinal sins. Things are traits that are completely uh, a no no, complete prohibitions. For example, envy. Envy is one of them, greed is another, right? Envy. You should never be envious. In Judaism, the Talmud will teach you that envy sometimes is good. How so? There's that great line in the Talmud that says, Ki not sofrim which means the envy of scribes will uh, bring more wisdom to the world. Because if I envy a scribe, if I envy someone that's intellectual, it will make me more intellectual. If I envy someone... Well, lust is a better one. Lust is... One, right? That's another seven, one, another seven cardinal sins. How do you channel lust? Maybe again by, I don't know how to channel lust. I'm sure there's a way to channel <laughs> lust. <laughs> how do you channel greed? <laughs> Gluttony, I think, is another one. How do you mm -hmm. channel that? I mean, 
Maybe on Shabbat, you can be a little bit gluttonous in honor of Shabbat. <laughs> but every, every, every trait can be channeled, can be clothed, again, to use the words of the Tanya here, it can be clothed in the right way. And very often, depending on the clothing that we give that, that emotion or that, that uh, desire, uh, the desire becomes either very powerful and effective and, and positive, or God forbid, the opposite. It all depends on the comments we give it, right? So, but that's, that's again, that's the reason why in Judaism we have no cardinal sins. It all depends how you use it. All depends. And I think it's important to note that because uh, that, that's the way God created us. Every one of us has different traits and different inclinations. And the sum of it all really is what makes us unique. No one is like me in the sum of all of my traits and inclinations. And no one is like you in the sum of all your traits and inclinations. But when we look at our, at that sum of all traits and inclinations, we can say, oh gosh, I have to get rid of this inclination and that inclination. And the other Tanya is something is saying something revolutionary. What he's saying is, no, don't try and get rid of it. Just garment it, clothe it in the right way. Use it, channel it in the right way. That's quite quite revolutionary. I think it's it's also quite quite uh, uh, quite the secret of education. Of good education, where, taught, where parents or educators don't try and impose traits, impose ways on their children, on their students, but rather they try and mold their traits, the traits that they have, those students have, in the most effective way. And that's what the Tanya area is trying to do. It all depends, again, on the garments, on the clothing of those desires. Okay. So it's true for the animal soul and its and its desires too. That's what this is saying. Let's continue maybe a little bit more again, unless there's more comments, questions, whatever. Okay. Okay, so Margot, go, go for it. In this slide. In or this anyone slide, else. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. In this slide, the transformation of the animal soul is not a transformation of its essence, but a process of educating, training, and refocusing its will. The will of the animal soul serves as the evil inclination, Yetzir Hara, within man only as long as it desires evil, but of itself, inwardly, it is not evil. It's de it desires evil, not because it is evil, but because it conceives of it as good. A baby who eats garbage does not do so out of corrupt inner nature, but because he thinks that it's a tasty food, because he has not yet been educated. Right. So he has a desire for food. But very often, because it hasn't been clothed well, then uh, he goes and eats garbage. So he has to be educated. That's that's part of the process of, of clothing, is, is educating it, saying, you have a desire, that's fine, that's good, that's all right. And let me channel it so that it doesn't, let me clothe it so that it doesn't become destructive. You know, the Midrash says, and we'll, maybe we'll conclude with this, but the Midrash, uh, it's, it's actually a passage in the Talmud that speaks about how the sages... Uh, once thought that uh, they got together and they, they they said to themselves, well, we think that the greatest source of destruction in this world is promiscuity. There's too much promiscuity in this world. So let's do something original. Let's try and capture the 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 desire for promiscuity, the the what you would call today the sex drive, and let's encage it and let's see what happens with the world. Let's see if our world becomes better. So they captured that demon. And they caged it, and they waited. And they saw that the world indeed became better, but the problem was that no one was having children. And they said that if we kill this uh, demon, then the world will end. So they decided to release it. But what, what is this passage saying? What this is saying is that, yes, there are desires. There are animalistic desires sometimes even. But if we can clothe them and channel them again in the right way, then they can become very effective. Unfortunately, if they are let loose and wild, like that child who's hungry, but he eats garbage, then it can become very destructive. It's all a matter of how we clothe our desires. That's what it's all about. 